you are listening to Through Time and Clades. My name is Albert. And I'm Joan. Excellent. Uh, so today is the first episode that we're recording in October, and therefore uh, we are going to do uh, our usual monthly roundup of interesting nature news items that we noticed uh, over the past month, which was, of course, September. So how are you? I'm doing very well. Uh, it's been a been a productive month for me. <laughs> That's good to hear. Yeah, it's a uh, it's been quite a good one for me too in terms of productivity. I've been quite busy due to various deadlines. I've probably mentioned a few times before that I'm uh, that I had to prepare a presentation for the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology Conference that's coming up. So I recorded mm -hmm. my talk. Yeah, and uh, and that's done. Um, uh, I was working on kind of the final touches on a on a paper I'm writing, and uh, it it should be coming out you know relatively soon. Uh, it it's gotten accepted, and so we'll we'll see how that goes. Um, and I'm supposed to write a book review for the um, Paleontological Association newsletter, um, which I, I still need to work on. <laughs> uh, deadlines approaching quickly, but uh, I still need to write write the actual review. Um, well, speaking of reviews, uh, I believe you actually have prepared some reviews for for this uh, this week's episode. That's right. Yeah, we're we're, we're doing something a, a little bit different. Um, I'm going to talk about one news story that jumped out at me, but I wanted to use my other block to review some media that I had engaged in this month. And let me tell you, was there a lot to a lot to cover and talk about? I mean, just ignoring the many books that I've plowed through this month i mean oh there was a challenger the last flight which was a, a documentary that came out on netflix not too long ago about the uh, challenger space shuttle mission it's a four-part series and uh, i watched that all in one day with my sister um that was very moving and mm -hmm. very engaging um and then what else uh oh uh, cosmos cosmos possible worlds they're doing a second airing of that series again. Oh, wow. Um, nice. This time, uh, it's the Fox run. So if you remember Cosmo's Spacetime Odyssey, it was a simultaneous broadcast with National Geographic Channel and Fox. Mm -hmm. Well, for some reason, this time around, um, they aired it first on National Geographic back in March and April, and then now they're going for uh, September and October mm -hmm. for Fox. So, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. And that is on... Uh, Tuesdays, Tuesday nights, uh, depending on where you're from. So uh, definitely check that out. Give them their support. Um, oh, let me see. Let me see. Uh, there was The Social Dilemma, which is another Netflix documentary about uh, the impact of social media on society, which was very insightful. Um, not to mention the PBS series Hacking Your Mind, which mm. covers similar topics uh, along with others. It's more about social psychology. Um, that, that's an okay-ish show. Um, they have the final episode uh, this Sunday, so I'm going to check that out, and I'll have my final verdict. Mm -hmm. um, oh my gosh, what else? What else? Uh, ooh, um, also Sunday, yeah. David Attenborough, he's got a new show coming out, or yeah, yeah. a documentary, I'd say, on, on Netflix as well. N Netflix has been doing mm -hmm. very well, it seems. Yeah. Um, it's a David Attenborough, a life on this planet. Uh. Um, and judging from the trailer, this is, to put it bluntly, uh, his witness statement. Right. You know, his, he's been doing wildlife filmmaking and, and research for something like 70 years or so. Yeah. And he's 94 now, and he, he's been able to witness firsthand the great environmental changes that have been underway over the past few decades. Mm -hmm. and, this is sort of his message to the planet, if you will. Right. And uh, certainly be interested to see what he has to say, especially yeah. coming from somebody who's been literally around the world with every animal you can think of. And right. He's been able to see how they've changed in such a short time. Um, definitely looking forward to that. Yeah. Absolutely. Profound. But uh, out of all of this, I decided to settle on two particular things mm -hmm. to review 
So if we go to this slide here, my first slide, yep. um, this is another Netflix documentary. Uh, this came out in uh, on September 7th, and uh, I did not hear news about it initially. You know, I, 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 it just kind of happened upon me. You know, mm -hmm. I was at home with dad, and uh, we're, we're just scrolling through the movies and trying to find something to watch. And you know, he comes across My Octopus Teacher. And immediately we're both like, you know, what the hell is this? Mm -hmm. What is this? And uh, we kind of looked at each other and we went, why not? And we watched it. <laughs> and let me tell you, in the span of an hour and a half, I went from just a casual viewer watching this and you know, treating it like the usual nature documentary that comes out nowadays and to somebody who was immediately hooked and mm -hmm. genuinely cared about the individuals involved. And right. by the end of this thing, I, I was in tears. I was an emotional wreck. Uh, I couldn't function properly for the rest of the day. This documentary about an octopus just floored me. And I'm going to talk about it. So in short, uh, this movie is about a fellow named Craig Foster. He's the individual on the poster here. Uh, he's a photographer from South Africa who worked on a, a bunch of films about the local people and the wildlife of the region back in the, the 2000s and the 90s. Um, and at some point in his life, he became super depressed and really lost interest in his craft. And so what he did was he began to spend more and more time on the beach by his house snorkeling and swimming in the rough waters and at one point he finds a a little secluded space on the shore where the waves weren't as intense and he's exploring around there's all sorts of animals in the water you know he's swimming with jellies and little sea slugs and all sorts of fish and then he stumbles across a little octopus shielding herself with a bunch of rocks and shells and you know, this is a thing that some octopodes will do they uh, they'll attach hard objects to their suckers and kind of wrap them around their body like a present. Mm -hmm. And that makes it very difficult for predators like sharks to attack them. And so Foster leaves the cove and he thinks to himself, huh, I wonder what would happen if I came back to this cove every single day. Would this octopus come to trust me? And it turns out she does. Um, and so the rest of the documentary is spent following Foster's trips over the span of a year, visiting this octopus and slowly forming a, a bond, if you will. Uh, now, this is the part that always raises caution in me. Mm -hmm. I know there's a convoluted history in the study of animal behavior or ethology of researchers trying not to personify and anthropomorphize the animals that they study. Right. And... You know, here's an instance where that is probably happening. Um, and I mean, people have done that in the past. I mean, you saw this with, with Jane Goodall back in yep. the, the 1960s. You know, she got into a lot of trouble with several ethologists because not only was she naming the chimpanzees, she was talking about them as if they were having personalities. And I mean, based on what I've read and what I've seen, I'm genuinely willing to go along with it. I mean, if they have a good reason to do so, I mean, some animal groups are indeed fairly intelligent, at least by the standards that we impose upon them, mm. of course. Um, and, you know, something like an octopus, you know, those are the most intelligent of invertebrates when you're looking at them on their own. Um, I tend to think something like uh, eusocial insects, ants, bees, termites, are pretty intelligent as a unit, but on their own, octopus is probably... a uh, stands out yeah um and i mean in general it's it's hard to deny that many animals have so-called human-like personalities yeah. i mean <laughs> hell if you uh if you have a dog or a, a cat or a bird or mm. even a lizard mm. you see this sort of thing i mean uh, i remember i was reading um life in the undergrowth this is one of yeah uh, the book version of david attenborough series and in the introduction, he was talking about these captive jumping spiders that he worked with. And he was saying that he could clearly make out the spiders having different personalities. Mm. <laughs> so, you know, I I'm willing to go along with it. Um, but there still is always a, a little bit of caution mm -hmm. thrown in there. 
because I mean, I, I question whether we can really know the full extent of a non-human animal's intelligence. Right. Uh, Albert, I'm curious what you think about this. Yeah, I think uh, I, I think there, there there is a good reason for caution for sure. And yeah, like you said, it, it's probable we, we won't really ever know exactly what what's going on in a in a different species mind. Uh, but yeah, at the same time, I do feel there is quite a lot of evidence to suggest that things like personalities and emotion to some extent uh, is definitely not unique to us. It, we, we see it in, or, or see, you know, see it, see possible expressions of it, uh, in other animals as well. And definitely it seems particularly clear in the species that we consider to be particularly intelligent. Yeah, I, I tend to agree as well. I mean... Like using the Jane Goodall example, I mean chimpanzees. Mm -hmm. It's like them and bonobos; those are our closest living relatives, and the degree of similarities that we all share, as far as yeah, as far as you know, personalities, emotional intelligence. Um, there's really little to distinguish the the three of us. Mm. So, yeah, I mean, it, I think it's absolutely fair. Um, the evidence is, is strong um but i can certainly see the uh the caution when you extend that further beyond yeah uh vertebrates if you will mm -hmm. um you're like if you tell somebody an octopus is intelligent um unless they're well read you know they're probably going to be like what you mean that thing that i eat at, <laughs> right. at, at the restaurant you know that thing is intelligent and it's <laughs> like well yeah i mean th th there's no doubt now that Octopodes in particular are remarkable as far as mollusks go. Mm -hmm. I mean, you hear some of these stories and accounts of, you know, them playing or um, you know, learning to escape from their tanks to right. forage in <laughs> other tanks and come back to that same tank. <laughs> There's no denying that. Right. right. Um, so, uh, I mean, in, in any case, you know, what was really lovely about my octopus teacher was that you know it, it really does make for a good introduction to octopus biology mm. i mean not only to see all sorts of really neat behavior i mean you got you get hunting you get camouflage uh you have investigation you know how, how an octopus interacts with the world through its arms so that's where a lot of the uh the brain power is going towards um and i mean the photography itself is, is breathtaking mm -hmm. i mean foster really clearly knows a lot about marine life and he's really able to give you an intimate look into that world like this this south african kelp forest um i mean it, it's no wonder why uh the blue planet 2 team i think yeah. they recruited him to help out with photography or at right. least with um consultancy um now i i hesitate to give spoilers because it, i mean it, it's really one of those movies that you just need to see mm -hmm. without any inclination of what's going to happen right you know, you, you you gotta go in blank just let it take you on this journey for an hour and a half and you'll see why you know i was crying my eyes out like i did at the end of this thing mm -hmm. um and not to mention like the meaning of the title itself will begin to make a lot more sense mm -hmm. um, so uh if you have netflix you can check out my octopus teacher um Based on what I've seen, it's been getting great reviews on social media. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, it's my favorite film of the year, hmm. um, which is probably not saying much since, I mean, <laughs> there hasn't sure. exactly been a boom in movies this year for, <laughs> right. for serious reasons, you know? <laughs> um, oh my gosh, just think about the Oscars. <laughs> oh dear, yeah. Mm. I, I love the meme where Sonic the Hedgehog is going to get Best Picture. Oh, <laughs> right. <laughs> but uh yeah so that's my octopus teacher um to check it out <laughs> yeah uh if we go to the, the next slide yep. uh, i have my second piece of media so uh, this is a book um for a little bit of backstory here uh this is a book that technically came out last year um so the author is a historian a uh, rudger bregman um and he's dutch so the copy that I read is an English translation mm. and that particular edition came out this year. Mm. Um, and so uh, for reference on this slide, uh, I have the UK cover on the left 
and the American cover on the right. Mm -hmm. um, and as you can probably guess, the American cover is the one that I read. Now, uh, some of you might know Bregman if you like watching TED Talks. Um, he did one on poverty back in 2017. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a photo of him from that talk. Um, and you might also know him if you saw the oh big incidents like happened last year. Um, so he was invited to a debate that was held at the World Economic Forum, and this was in Switzerland. And uh, he essentially called out all of these millionaire philanthropists for not paying proper taxes yeah. and, and you know, talking about environmental stewardship and then you know flying on these enormous planes and not right. doing you know carbon carbon budgeting and that sort of thing um and th this is an issue that he's well known for speaking about against mm -hmm. you know uh, and so incidentally this caught the attention of fox news <laughs> and uh, none other than tucker carlson <laughs> <laughs> who is a kind and gentle human being <laughs> <laughs> um yeah the, <laughs> So yeah, he invited Bregman on for an interview for his show. Um, and, you know, basically Carlson thought that Bregman was on his side, you know, for quote unquote, sticking it to the leftists for their hypocrisy. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, no, Bregman, Bregman was quick to point out that conservatives were definitely not off the hook, you know, and uh, he even called out Carlson on accepting millions of dollars from the Koch brothers, mm. of all people. Right. Now, uh, as you can probably already guess, Carlson lost his shit, and he said some very rude things to Bregman, where Bregman just remained calm and stoic as ever. Um, <laughs> incidentally, this interview did not end up airing, after all. <laughs> and the only reason we know about it is because Bregman filmed everything backstage and put it on his YouTube <laughs> channel. <laughs> uh, a bit of a tangent, I know. But I mean, I think this sort of thing helps give a little bit of perspective to Rudger Bregman and his philosophy. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's only in his early 30s, and already he has gained quite a reputation as an inspired thinker and a historian mm -hmm. who's able to propose and discuss so-called radical ideas in a way that is actually very persuasive and realistic. Hmm. Um, and you know, it's this sort of thinking that stretched from his first book, which he called Utopia for Realists, uh, which I have yet to read, incidentally, um, and onto his second book, which is this one right here, Humankind, A Hopeful History. Um, this is the one that I'll be reviewing today. Hmm. Hmm. So uh, the book's core idea stems from the fact that a sizable number of scholars researchers, philosophers, religious figures, and on and on to non-specialists, they've basically argued that humans are naturally bad. Hmm. You know, we're a species that's been prone to aggression and violence since our inception, right. and it's taken the, the hard work of civilization to keep us from harming each hmm. other. We're this way because we're easily frightened by others, and we know other people are liars and cheats and are only driven by self-interest. And so we're quick to generalize and judge them. And then quickly you get tribalistic or xenophobic or racist or mm. sexist or some combination of all of those. Yeah. Um, now, th this particular philosophy has been encapsulated for quite a long time, but uh, it's probably best described by an English philosopher called Thomas Hobbes. This is all the way back in the, the 1650s, the, the mid-1650s. Um, and the elements of this idea since then have remained steadfast. Um, they were further fed by Machiavelli, for example, and then on and on to more recent authors like uh, Steven Pinker, mm -hmm. who um, is a bit of an infamous figure uh, <laughs> that's made quite a lot of enemies in the anthropological circle. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, that's a story for another time. Uh, so, uh, in essence, Rudger Bregman puts this idea to the test in his hopeful history, hmm. and he finds that there is really no evidence, scientific or historical, that suggests that humans are really so bad. In fact, he's arguing the opposite. You know, from our origins in the Pleistocene all the way to the present day, Homo sapiens has shown a remarkable capacity to work together, hmm. to trust one another, and to generally be kind. And that's not just with 
members of our own family. And that's not just with members of our own social group, but even beyond that to members of other social groups. Mm -hmm. you know, for, the, for the vast majority of our history as uh, hunter gatherers uh, or foragers, as I like to say, uh, you know, major conflicts were avoided by community action. Resources were shared equally. Uh, and ideas and technologies could be shared with greater numbers of people who could trust each other. Now, of course, Bregman is quick to point out, you know, we were not all angels throughout our history. There's always exceptions to these generalizations about prehistory. Um, but the overwhelming evidence Bregman presents, and this is from a, a wide range of sources, hmm. shows that almost everyone on Earth is living and working together peacefully. Hmm. You know, able to come up with solutions to problems and generally wanting the same things in life. Hmm. Safety, security, friendship, justice, and fairness. Um, so th there's two things in particular that really spoke to me deeply about this book. And it really made me appreciate and respect Breckman as both a historian and a visionary, hmm. to use that word. Um, for one. I love, love, love the deep investigative approach that he takes when it comes to scientific studies. You know, you know, it, in building his case study for humanity, you know, he really found himself digging deep into a bunch of these highly cited studies that everybody always throws out, and he managed to find several flaws that essentially made those studies, for lack of a better word, obsolete hmm. and inaccurate. You know, these are studies that were supposed to lend support to the idea that humans are just bad animals mm -hmm. by their nature. So uh, one example, uh, the Stanford prison experiment, and this was mm -hmm. from 1971. Now, if you're going in blind to the field of social psychology, you'll probably learn about this study. So basically, this professor, uh, Philip Zimbardo, who was inspired by one of his undergrad students to run a mock prison inside the basement, at Stanford University's psychology department. Uh, the idea was to test how the human mind was affected when placed in the role of prisoner or prison guard. And so he got a bunch of students that volunteered and pulled them all together and he gave them all their roles. Um, they actually staged it very particularly. They, everyone volunteered. And then uh, the night that the experiment started, they literally sent in these guards to arrest all these students out of their beds and they made a big deal about it and they brought them over to the basement. And uh, they all they all had their roles, you know. So some of them were prisoners who had to be locked behind bar bars, and uh, some of them were prison guards who had a little bit more free reign of the place. Um, but they still had to stay within the prison; they couldn't actually leave. Um, now, this undergrad student in particular, who kind of basically came up with the whole thing, it was a fellow named David Jeff, uh, and he was a consultant for the experiment. And he came up with the rules that the guards had to follow. And then they were left to their own devices for a few days. Uh, I want to say it was two weeks that this was, this was supposed to run, but that might be wrong. Um, and what happened next uh, was infamous. By the second day, the mock prison had descended into chaos. You know, the prisoners were going hysterical, and they weren't complying with the guards. And the guards just grew mad with power and actively abused all the prisoners. You know, they were going as far as taking away their mattresses and letting them sleep on the ground, um, ha having them stand naked for hours at a time, uh, not even letting them clean out their poop buckets. Mm. So they had to stay with all that stench. Um, it wasn't an, a whole mess. And they had to ex the end of this experiment very early because of that. Mm. Mm. And so what Zimbardo got out of the little time that he had was this revolutionary experiment on psychology and how easy it is for any average Joe off the street to lose their humanity, you know, whether they're put in positions of power or forced into a degrading state. Or so we all thought. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so Bregman dug deeper and deeper into the Stanford prison experiment, and he found that a lot of the results were actually artificially manufactured by Zimbardo and Jeff. So in other words, it was an improper experiment because at every turn, all the variables were changed. You know, it turns out that the guards and the prisoners didn't grow mad on their own. They were actively encouraged to do so. Huh. You know, 
a lot of the guards didn't want to be rough with the prisoners. You know, should conflict arise, they, they actually wanted to handle it calmly and peacefully. And so Jaff had to actually go in there and pressure all of them and make them get aggressive and mean. Mm. Um, and then the students who volunteered to be the prisoners, well, when some of them realized that when they signed up for this, you know, they couldn't actually study for exams behind bars like they needed to, you know, they actively faked their insanity so they could be let out early from the mm. experiment. Right, right. <laughs> it, what's really telling is none of this was in the original report. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, you know, if that isn't a big red flag, um, and it, it's really telling, you know, when Zimbardo was eventually called out on it years after the fact, mm. he basically shrugged and was like, hey, listen, this is one of the most famous psychology studies out there, and everyone is talking about it. You can debunk it all you like, but it is never going away. So, you know, how, how do you respond to something like that, right? right? Uh, so similar famous studies are pulled apart in this way. And so when Bregman pulls out these actual honest studies that were done properly, what you find is that almost everyone is kind at heart. And, you know, they don't want to inflict harm on anyone, regardless of where they're at in the so-called hierarchies or so. Given the opportunity, people will work out whatever differences they have and become good friends. You know, this whole idea of humans being violent from the start and then needing civilization to control themselves, well, it turns out that the evidence for that is lacking or non-existent as well. Uh, I, I mentioned Steven Pinker, uh, for example. Uh, he, he wrote a book not too long ago called The Better Angels of Our Nature, huge bestseller. And uh, there's a notable chart in there, well, a lot of charts in there, so it looks scholarly, right? Mm -hmm. um, but there's one particular chart in there where he's showing that forager societies have a 14% homicide rate versus agricultural states where the number shrinks to almost zero. You know, and that's even factoring in the world wars. Apparently, we're in the most peaceful era of human history. <laughs> well, um, it turns out it's a bit more complicated than that. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't want to go too, too deep into this mm -hmm. because it is a relevant topic in my human evolution series. Yeah, and yeah. Mm -hmm. I want to unpack that more there. So I, I will say this, uh, Pinker's 14% homicide rate for foragers turned out to be false mm -hmm. because when you actually look at the societies that he used, that number comes from modern forager groups that integrated uh, agricultural technologies into their economy. Mm -hmm. you know, they were already well into a state of colonization. Right. And a lot of these so-called homicides were actually caused by colonizing powers uh -huh. on the included peoples, then between the members of the forager societies themselves. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, again, the evidence is very clear and it's growing that humans are not these monsters that are just waiting to come out and cause harm when the time is right. Mm. You know, we're mostly peaceful, cooperating species, and we've been that way for much of our history. Um, and uh, the second thing that I want to bring up that I really, really love are the true stories about human cooperation and, and love in times of distress. Um, there's a whole bunch of really touching examples of people placed in, in difficult situations and still holding on to their humanity, despite whatever is being thrown at them. Uh, I, I really don't want to give too many of these stories away. Mm -hmm. I'd love for people to go in and, and find these for themselves, but, uh, one of my favorites has to be uh, the Christmas of 1914. This is on the eve of World War I. So there's the threat of a battle taking place on Christmas Day somewhere in France. And so at that point, you have the British and the German troops are all out there in the trenches. And you know, they're just waiting for the other to start shooting, right? Mm -hmm. And then out of nowhere, this is, this is Christmas Eve. The Germans started lighting candles and they're, they're singing Christmas songs. And then now the British are like, well, let's sing too. And they start singing their Christmas songs. Mm -hmm. And then this keeps going on until the whole field is erupting in a, in a mutual chorus of song. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then there's another field in, in Belgium. It's the same night. And, and the British could overhear the Germans asking if they had a light for a cigarette. Now, before long, one of the corporals actually heads out onto the battlefield, onto to no man's land. And he gives the German his light. Mm -hmm. And then before long, everyone's doing it. 
and all the Germans and the British are chatting it up and they're making friendships. And then the following morning, Christmas morning, they're all out on the battlefield again and they're swapping presents and sharing tea and schnapps and they're, they're taking photos and then they're all playing a football game together. Mm, wow. <laughs> All these groups that are prepared to kill each other are hanging out like kids at a college party. (laughs) (laughs) And it it sounds absolutely nuts, but there is abundant eyewitness accounts and there's video and photographic evidence from both sides that confirm that these things really happen. Mm -hmm. You know, despite all the government run propaganda and all the political strife and whatnot, all these people found brothers in each other. And it demonstrates a very fundamental idea in the world of social psychology. You know, the further away you are from people who are not in your group, the easier it is to be led to dehumanize them mm-hmm. and hate them. You know, it's not like you're interacting with them at all. Right. You know, all the information and news you're probably hearing about them is almost certainly loaded with bias. You know, all it takes for people to respect and love each other is to meet up hang out and talk it it turns out deep down we all want the same thing Mm -hmm. and you know there were no inherent differences between the germans and the british when they got together they realized they had a lot in common and i I think the saddest part about all of this you know had each nation's military leaders not then ordered prohibitions on these sorts of encounters like on christmas day it is probably likely that world war one would have ended faster than it started Mm -hmm. and that's that's incredible you know humans are not hardwired for war or naturally violent whatever that's supposed to mean most of us tend to have a revulsion towards killing other human beings and and you can see this in battles of the civil war that are mentioned in this book you know after gettysburg this is 1863 it was revealed that 90 percent of the recovered muskets were still loaded full of gunpowder. Mm-hmm. And many of them were actually double or triple, triple filled and then never fired at all. And similarly, you have the French soldiers and their enemies during the 1860s. They were so disinterested in shooting each other that they nearly all fired over each other's heads for hours on end. And so it's this sort of thing that might partly explain why you see this gradual change in the history of warfare you know, with battles and weapons growing further and further apart. Right. Until now, you know, you have drones that can kill people, anybody you want, and you don't even have to be in the same country as them. Yeah, right. It's so much easier to hate and harm other humans when you don't have to look at them in the eyes. Mm. Yeah. Um, you know, I've been going on for a while now. I, I was just really, really moved by this book. You know, I read this, it's over 400 pages. I read all of this in just three days. You know, right from the day I came in the mail, it made that much of an impact on me. Mm-hmm. Uh, the information is incredible. Um, it's almost certainly a series of shocks and delights to the mind, mm-hmm. to whoever reads it, even if you don't necessarily agree with everything Bregman proposes. Um, and I just cannot recommend it enough. You know, it, it might just be one of those antidotes for all the pessimism and cynicism in the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I'll end by mentioning one of Bregman's key themes in the book. You know, it, it's, the, it's the thing that ties the whole book together. Realism doesn't have to equal pessimism. Mm-hmm. You, know, you, you say, oh, you know, are, are you an optimist? Like, no, I'm a realist. Mm-hmm. Usually when people say that, they're, they're a pessimist. <laughs> you know, all the evidence shows that optimism and indeed a, a hope for humanity is as real as rain. And uh, I'll... I'll end things there. <laughs> that was lovely. Yeah, I mean, it it touches me hearing you speak about it, and I I do look forward to reading it myself someday. Um, it's yeah, I I would I also do get the sense, even though I'm not particularly well read in anthropology, that you know the whole idea of humans being inherently aggressive is is rather overstated. Obviously, there have been numerous atrocities committed by humans. Uh, both now and in the past, but um, it, I, I think it's true that a lot, of, a lot of our society is founded on cooperation and empathy and kindness, and I, I think it's worth um, worth emphasizing that. And 
That is great. Uh, so yeah, thanks for, for sharing this book. It sounds amazing. Absolutely. You're welcome. I look forward to hearing your thoughts. <laughs> well, we'll see. We'll, we'll see if I get there. Uh, but it's like 50 books to read. But <laughs> oh, true. That, that's okay. yeah, but, but yeah, I'll, I'll definitely put it on the list somewhere. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, I, I guess we could uh, change track and shift into our, our news stories then. But uh, that, was, yeah. that was great. And def definitely, I hope... Um, in future episodes, we can do similar uh, reviews if we if we come across, you know, uh, books or other media of interest. Yeah, that'd be a great idea. <laughs> All right. So, uh, my first story. So I'm, I'll do the usual um, two news stories format uh, in this episode. Uh, my first story is going to be about hummingbirds, uh, which are a wonderful group of birds. I, I think you know mo most people love hummingbirds. Um, Yes, just incredible animals. Um, and hummingbirds, uh, among other unusual features, uh, go through something called torpor. Um, and this may sound familiar if you listen to our previous news episode, because last time we talk about, or talked about torpor in Lystrosaurus, which was a stem mammal from the Triassic in Permian. Uh, so torpor is basically... Uh, when an animal slows down its metabolism dramatically, uh, oftentimes if it's a, a warm-blooded animal, an animal that produces its own body heat, uh, it'll basically drop its body temperature dramatically, um, and that allows it to conserve resources because it doesn't doesn't need to expend as much energy um, producing so much body heat. And so they just co go kind of into a dormant state temporarily if they need to, and that helps them survive harsh conditions. And what hummingbirds do is they would go through this every single night. Um, because as you might imagine, something as small as a hummingbird with such a high metabolism, they basically have to be you know, almost constantly feeding during the day. And they, they feed on very uh, sugar-rich nectar, of course, for the most part. And so that, that's just what they do all day, just keep drinking nectar and defending their nectar sources from other hummingbirds. They're very aggressive in that regard, uh, fight a lot. In fact, the um, the Aztec god of war was uh, symbolized by a hummingbird for that reason. Um, they are, yeah, yeah, <laughs> they are pugnacious. But uh, during the night, when it's not so suitable for foraging, and of course they do need to sleep at some point, um, what they will do is they will go through torpor and they'll they'll drop their body temperature dramatically, and they'll, they'll basically look and feel if you touch them, they they'll feel cold. They'll look for all intents and purposes like they're dead. Um, but in the morning, they'll warm right back up and go back to feeding and fighting and all those other hummingbird things. So uh, that's that's the way they survive the night. Now, remarkably enough, uh, there are hummingbirds that live up in the Andes Mountains over three kilometers above sea level. And as you can imagine, uh, that's a very, very cold environment to live in, especially if you're a small and metabolically active animal. But there are many species up there. And so this study looked at torpor specifically in these Andean hum hummingbirds, uh, you know, where torpor would be especially important for surviving. So what they did was they looked at several species of hummingbirds from the Andes, and they measured their body temperatures, as well as uh, how much body mass they lost after waking up from, from their, these torpor events. Uh, yeah, like ima imagine like losing a significant percentage of your body mass every night. Uh, that is, that tells you something about how, what it's like to be a hummingbird. Well, it turns out, uh, interesting enough, there was a fair bit of variation in terms of the body temperatures that they, they drop to during torpor uh, among the different species. Uh, and the species with the that drop to the lowest body temperatures during torpor exhibited the least amount of mass loss, which means that they basically conserved the most amount of energy, so they, they didn't they didn't lose weight during this period. And all of the members, or rather all of the species that uh, have the lowest body temperatures, belong to a specific clade of hummingbirds that we call the coquettes. Uh, technically, they're called low fornithinines. Um, and this particular clade is very diverse in the Andes. 
And so basically the take home message of the study is that it seems that uh, there is one particular clade of hummingbirds that is particularly, I guess you could say good at torpor, that is they, the, the torpor is particularly effective at preventing them from uh, losing weight and wasting energy. And this might have helped them, this particular clade, survive in the very harsh conditions of the Andes relative to the other hummingbird groups. And they found what is basically a current uh, world record for the lowest body temperature recorded in a bird. Uh, that was a species of hummingbird called the black metal tail. Uh, and it, of course, is a member of this coquette clade. And uh, there's a, an individual one pictured on the slide. Uh, they found one individual where they recorded a body temperature of about three degrees centigrade, which is really low, like, you know, close to freezing. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, lowest body temperature recorded for a bird, and well, one of the lowest probably of any uh, warm-blooded animal. There are some hibernating mammals that can drop their body temperature to below freezing, uh, uh, with without actually you know f physically freezing uh, due to special physiological ad adaptations that they have. But uh, out of like non-hibernating animals, this is I think this is probably the lowest uh, body temperature recorded for a warm-blooded species. So that's quite remarkable. Um, as uh, one of the authors uh, actually pointed out on his Twitter, I think his name is uh, Christopher Witt, uh, it is very likely, in fact, it is almost guaranteed that this record will be surpassed uh, eventually. Uh, and that the reason is because when they measured these body temperatures, they weren't doing it during a time of year when the climate is the coldest during uh, in the Andes. So when mm -hmm. times are even colder, it's quite probable that these hummingbirds can attain even lower body temperatures during their torpor. Uh, so it, it seems like it's a matter of time before we find, you know, an even lower body temperature. But either way, the, you know, the, this shows us uh, or sheds some light on how these hummingbirds manage to survive in such harsh conditions. Yeah, that's incredible. Yeah. <laughs> so on the on the next slide, I have a little um, figure from their paper that that basically shows this um, the these results. Uh, so it, it looks a little scary. Um, but uh, basically what this is, is they, on the left, they have plotted out the body temperatures that they recorded during uh, of these birds during torpor um, uh, onto a phylogeny of these birds. And so the, the ones with the lower body temperatures are, you know, are the ones with the shades of color closer to blue and the ones with higher body temperatures during torpor are shaded closer to red. And you can see that all of the ones that have the lowest body temperatures are closely related to one another. So they are part of this coquette clade. And on the right shows you the amount of uh, mass loss that these birds experience during torpor. And again, you can see it lines up very well. The ones that lose the least amount of mass, the ones with the shades of blue are the ones with the lowest body temperatures. Um, whereas the ones that maintain higher body temperatures during torpor lose more mass. Um, and you can see that this is phylogenetically related. So that's essentially what, um, what they found. So that is very cool. I, I saw quite a few uh, news articles about this study. Um, do you have anything else to add? Well, I think it's, it's fascinating that it, it's, it's further evidence of, of the ingenuity of mountain dwelling species mm -hmm. to adapt to their environments. Um, yeah, I was I was reading the other day about how uh, Andean peoples uh -huh. have adapted themselves over time uh, yeah. to such high elevations, and how you know Andean kids can play games high on a mountain with little effort, while somebody of the same age from another part of the world would be struggling to breathe and move. Right, right. It, it, it's really incredible. Um, wow. So the the lowest body temperature achieved by a vertebrate. Does that include a uh, fish? Well, it achieved by a, an endothermic vertebrate, that is. Yeah, obviously. Oh, um, okay. That's yeah. Right. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, in, there are ectotherms that, that uh, get, get to much lower body temperatures than that. Um, yeah, I was going to say, um, I was a little bit confused there. <laughs> I yeah, was like, wait a minute, isn't there like ice fish and, and all these all these examples? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, no. Well, warm-blooded animals for for warm-blooded animals, and and it's n the non-hibernating ones because because um there there are hibernating mammals that can that can attain lower body temperatures below freezing, um while they're while they're hibernating. But uh, 
yeah gotcha okay no that's awesome uh all right i guess uh in that case we can move to the study that you picked out yeah sure i am um... oh my gosh yeah it it was a nice month for news stories about human origins uh -huh. Uh -huh. human evolution um but to cover those it would make more sense to put them in the context of of the story of human evolution i see so as much as i'd love to talk about all of those now let's wait and okay yeah you know, we'll cover those in, in later episodes so i am picking this one which i thought was really really cool uh -huh. Uh -huh. about air breathing eurypterids mm -hmm. so this is a study by jane c lansdell and colleagues uh for those not in the know uh eurypterids are traditionally called sea scorpions uh, or sometimes water scorpions uh, depending on who you ask um and ever since paleontologists had started studying their fossils, you know, they've been recognized as these major members of marine and freshwater faunas during the times in which they lived, uh, the middle of the Paleozoic era, towards the, the end of the Permian mass extinction event. Uh, remarkable animals. Um, they were likely predators. Some of them had grasping pinchers or spines that would have been really great for catching early fish and right. other organisms um and some of them of course were absolutely enormous um yes by some estimates it's like they're among the largest arthropods that ever lived yeah um it's like stretching to a, a max length of 2.5 meters long right i mean that, that's comparable to like crocodilians um, <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know that could, that could easily uh, outsize a small car mm -hmm. um and I should add, for, um, despite the common name of sea scorpion or water scorpion, uh, Eurypterids were not true scorpions. That is, they weren't members of the clade Scorpiones. Um, as far as we know, they had nothing to do with the direct ancestry of that specific group, despite the morphological similarities. Because, I mean, you know, we call them sea scorpions because they look like scorpions. It's... Naming things despite their biology, <laughs> as right, a, right. A Abby Howard once put it. <laughs> um, you know, there are a lot of living arachnids that are also called scorpions, um, like whip scorpions, oh, right. but are also not in the same group. Oh, yes. um, and uh, th that being said, uh, Eurypterids and arachnids and two curious groups, so the horseshoe crabs and then the sea spiders, mm -hmm. you know, those are all nonetheless close relatives, and yeah. they're allied in a larger group, uh, Shelly Serrata. Mm -hmm. So they do share a common ancestor, at least. Now, we've known for a couple of years now that Eurypterids might have been able to venture out onto the land, at least temporarily. Right. Um, there's a couple trackways that have been suggested to have been made by Eurypterids of various types. Um, there's a set in the Devonian of India, and there's another one from the Carboniferous of Scotland, um, and like this, this was further elaborated. If you remember walking with monsters, yes. they had the, <laughs> the Ordovician episode. No, Silurian. Uh, Silurian, Silurian I think. Yeah. Yeah, and then they show um, this, uh, all some of these scorpions coming out onto the land. Yes. Um, so uh, even if it becomes definitive that you know these are indeed eurypterid tracks, like we know one hundred percent this was a eurypterid. You know, there's still the issue of just what they were doing while they were up there. Um, you know, were, were they able to breathe the air or not? And th that was the key issue that was behind this study. So from the fossils that have been preserved well enough to study, we've learned that Eurypterids housed their respiratory organs on the underside of their exoskeleton, you know, it was right between the limbs. And uh, there are these little projections called opercula that run towards the tail end in a row of five or so mm -hmm. and sprouting from each of these opercula are what are called gill lamellae and these help the animal extract oxygen from the water and this arrangement is very similar to the book lungs that you see in horseshoe crabs incidentally now this new study uh this is a french carboniferous eurypterid uh oh this names uh this is adelopthalmus pyrii uh, uh, I'm sure I, I may have butchered that a little bit. Um, but anyway, this species shows very remarkable 
three-dimensional preservation of the respiratory system. Mm -hmm. And by looking into this deeper, there have been some really neat insights that have been revealed, um, most significant of which was the presence of these previously undetected structures that are actually attached to the gill lamellae, and these are called uh, trabeculae. Mm -hmm. Now, these are used in living species that have them to help keep the lamellae intact and allow the organism to breathe the air, mm -hmm. which means that this particular eurypterid, at least, and the authors extrapolate that most of them might have had this, you know, they would have been able to breathe air when they left the water, right? You know, which would have helped them stay out for much longer periods of time than other neighboring arthropod groups. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, in the world of the living Shelly serrates, uh, horseshoe crabs lack trabeculae. Mm -hmm. So when they go out on land to breed during the night, they can't actually breathe the air because otherwise their book lungs begin to collapse mm -hmm. if they stray too far from the water. So, which is why when you watch these things laying eggs, they stay in the surf. Right, right. Now, there's only one clade of arachnids um, that have trabeculae out of the whole group. And this is a rather large group called the arachnopulmonata. Mm -hmm. So this is the true scorpions, uh, the spiders, and the pedipalpians. Mm -hmm. So that's the whip scorpions that I talked about. And also uh, whip spiders, again, another instance of weird naming because whip spiders aren't spiders <laughs> um, and then several extinct groups uh trigum tarbids for example uh now all the other arachnids uh mites and the harvestmen and the solipugids and so forth you know they don't have trabeculae either they they seem to have lost them in the distant past if we go by what phylogenetic studies mm. tell us and incidentally it's the phylogenetic implications of air breathing eurypterids that are really fascinating uh, some of you might remember if you tuned in to the Dino Nerds for Black live stream that we did back in June, uh, you might remember the coverage of Myriapod evolution, uh, yes. uh, uh, our segment. Um, and that particular study, uh, that was uh, Edgecombe et al. Mm -hmm. uh, of 2020. Uh, and they found confirming evidence that Myriapods, and this is the group, uh, again, that includes centipedes and millipedes and, and their kin, uh, they likely evolved from marine arthropods that experimented with terrestrial living mm -hmm. at some point between the Cambrian and the Ordovician periods. And well, it turns out that thanks to this study, arachnids almost certainly had a similar start. Right. Uh, the molecular clock is near contemporaneous uh, for uh, with the myriapods mm -hmm. uh, for the date of the origin of the common ancestor. So these would have evolved at some point between the late Cambrian and the early Ordovician. And this ancestor in particular was almost certainly acquainted uh, with a terrestrial lifestyle by this time, which is interesting because uh, the current oldest fossils of land living arachnids are a lot younger than that. Yeah, right. So it's only a matter of time till we probably find them. Uh, now, given that the arthropod lineage evolved in a marine context, you know, there would have been an earlier transitional period as well for arachnids, where you have certain groups that are gradually moving further and further away from the marine world. Right. Now, in most conventional phylogenetic studies, the closest living relatives of arachnids are horseshoe crabs, followed by the sea spiders. Mm -hmm. Now, both the horseshoe crabs and the sea spiders are strictly marine clades. Um, and thus, by convention, you know, you'd look for transitional semi-aquatic ancestors on the lineage closer to arachnids than horseshoe crabs. Right. In other words, you want to look for stem arachnids. Now, uh, when fossil forms are included in these studies, what we find is that eurypterids tend to come out as stem arachnids. And given what we now know, thanks to the study, uh, they're likely to represent these just just these sorts of key stages in the transition to land. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was proposed by the authors that the common ancestor of both arachnids and eurypterids would likely have been a semi-terrestrial animal. Right. And, you know, thus, the, the following evolutionary histories of the two clades become ever clear. Uh, arachnids shifted primarily towards a terrestrial existence with several members of individual clades then going back to the water. So you have things like the 
uh, the bubble spiders and, and, and yeah. freshwater mites and things like yeah. that. Um, I think there's some coastal spiders as well. As yeah, examples. I think so. Yeah. And, and meanwhile, the Eurypterids, while they did make trips on the land and may have experimented a little bit with that, mm -hmm. they would end up remaining primarily aquatic. Right, right. Um, I mean, it's difficult to imagine a lot of the later giant species these 2.5 meter mm -hmm. things actually being able to haul themselves onto the land comfortably mm -hmm. um but at least for all the, the smaller members of the group basically everybody else yeah you know, this behavior seems to check out right, right um time will tell whether a, a semi-aquatic origin of arachnids holds out as well um the authors do mention that there are a few other fossils of crown arachnids mm -hmm. uh, mostly early scorpions that suggests that these animals were semi-aquatic mm, right, but right apparently those are heavily contested mm, mm. which was kind of a surprise to me i was yeah. under the impression that we we knew enough about them to be confident right uh, we'll just have to wait for more and better fossils of stem arachnids and, mm. and early crown arachnids almost certainly yeah um i, I should mention uh, just real quick mm. Uh, I didn't want to go too deep into this because it's kind of a convoluted thing uh -huh. for what the authors eventually talk about. Right. Um, they do bring up those earlier studies. Uh, I think some of them from, from from earlier this year, some from earlier last year, mm -hmm. that were suggesting that horseshoe crabs were actually derived arachnids. Yes. Yes. That became secondarily aquatic yeah. then, um, because the, their closest living relatives. Um, uh, the Ricinulids, the, the hooded tick spiders, these are fully terrestrial animals that live in dank, deep, tropical jungles uh, of, of Africa mm. and in South America. Um, they do mention that, well, if we if we're to take this hypothesis and apply it with the fossil forms, um, that would mean that both horseshoe crabs and eurypterids would likely have become secondarily aquatic mm. or at least evolved semi-aquatic ancestors and that you would have had not one not two but like three or four or five <laughs> independent trips onto the land right. within iraq proper mm -hmm. which is fascinating to think about um but with all of that the authors basically say that well that doesn't really seem likely based on the data that we have <laughs> right um, even ignoring the, the the laws of parsimony um mm. There seem to be other adaptations, not just these trabeculae among Eurypterids, that show that while these groups were experimenting with going on land, there was a general trend in the evolution of the group towards more aquatic existences. Yeah. Um, which is not indicative of an animal that evolved from a terrestrial organism and only then went back to the sea. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems most of the evolution of this group was in an aquatic environment. Right. So the authors basically mentioned that as neat as that sounds, it's probably unlikely, mm. but they, 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 they're willing to wait for more evidence. Right, um, right. Because again, it's one of those things where a lot of these phylogenetic studies that are saying that horseshoe crabs are arachnids, well, they're not including fossil forms. Mm. So there's probably some things that are, that are being purposely made unclear because mm. we're not including those transitional species mm. or extinct lineages for that matter. Um, what's really funny is I, learning about the study and reading it, um, I discovered a, a group of extinct stem arachnids, oh, incidentally, yeah. I, I had never heard of before. Uh -huh. um, funny name. I'm going to, I'm going to try to say it. Uh, Snizifosurina. Huh. Um, I don't think I'd heard it, of it either. Really, yeah. Uh, they, they, they look kind of like horseshoe crab uh -huh. trilobite hybrids, huh. um, in a sense. They, they got the, the big head of a horseshoe crab, yeah. but then the thorax ribbed like oh, a trilobite. Wow. Interesting. Um, yeah, it, it turns out most of them are actually blind. Uh -huh. um, only a few of them have functioning compound eyes. Um, and a lot of the fossils have not preserved the limbs that they almost certainly would have had. Right. Um, oh. Now, according to the literature that whole group is a paraphyletic assemblage. Hmm. So some of these are closer to horseshoe crabs and some of these are closer to eurypterids and arachnids. And so 
part of me wonders, you know, if we find really good fossils of these things, you know, are we going to find these sort of semi-terrestrial adaptations that we see in this particular species of Eurypterid? And mm -hmm. will that help kind of clarify things in early arachnid evolution? Um, I, I certainly love to find out. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> yeah, so uh, that's all I had to say. Say, um, Albert, was there anything you wanted to add, buddy? Well, I, I think this is pretty fascinating. Yeah, it's definitely very rare to find such delicate structures preserved in, in an arthropod, even though their exoskeletons are relatively common fossils. Um, so it's it's great that we now have this information. And yeah, I, I am aware that the the hypothesis of horseshoe crabs being nested inside arachnids is a, is a pretty controversial one. It has, it has certainly been found in several molecular studies, um, but not all of them. And yeah, one of my uh, former um, supervisors, so while I was doing my master's, um, one of my supervisors uh, was Jesus Lozano Fernandez. He he was the first author on another um, uh, calicerate phylogeny uh, paper uh, that came out last year, which uh, did not support the whole horseshoe crab as arachnids thing so yeah it definitely seems like it's, it's something we have still yet to completely figure out oh yeah i mean I, i'm certainly not i'm not attached to any one hypothesis right. um, i'm just curious to see where the evidence is going yeah yeah um, i mean I, I don't really know enough about these these things to to really judge anyways um right yeah the the other thing is that i um, I was, I'm reminded of that old video that used to be at the Smithsonian. I, I think you, you know where I'm going with this. <laughs> uh, oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, it, unfortunately, it's not there anymore uh, because they renovated the paleontology exhibits and uh, that part did not make it into the new renovation. But uh, there used to be a video that was on display at the paleontology exhibits at the Smithsonian uh, National Museum of Natural History about... Uh, the colonization of land by animals and there was one snippet of it that was uh, a cartoon uh eurypterid uh as a news reporter just broad broadcasting uh, about his exploration of land uh, i think his name was arthur pod because you know arthur pod <laughs> yeah, right right <laughs> <laughs> that was funny yes yeah, hilarian broadcast company <laughs> <laughs> oh I, I gotta dig out my old fan art oh yeah, yeah i right. made fan art Yes. yes. <laughs> Put yes, it yes. on deviant art. Uh, I'll find it, and we'll be sure to link it. Well, guys. yeah, yeah. Um, we'll, we'll we'll share the link. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, yeah. Like like I said, unfortunately, the the video is not not on exhibit anymore. But uh, there there might still be YouTube footage of it, so we, we can try and search that up too. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, no, that's very relevant. Um, so I guess not only the I guess the the prestige of this Eurypterid going on land, this anchor. Right. Is, is a little bit lesser because it's like you know because they were treating it like it was the moon landing right like oh, right. going yes. out and this is a big thing and it's like oh psych he could actually probably breathe out there the whole time <laughs> <laughs> yes, so, yes. It, it all worked out um, <laughs> that's so funny <laughs> yeah i know i was part of me was kind of hopeful like oh maybe they'll do an, a renovated version right, for, right. The, for the um exhibit but they didn't uh, yeah. but i mean it, it's no big deal i mean that, that exhibit itself oh my gosh i, I could spend a whole episode <laughs> talking about it. that was oh the kids are so lucky to, right, to, to, right. Get to grow up and, 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 and get a really really beautiful introduction to paleontology yeah, absolutely um, uh, congratulations to everybody who who worked on that mm -hmm. oh i'm excited to see future and what, what else is planned right right <laughs> indeed yeah i hope i can go back there someday and, and see the new the new version of the exhibit because it definitely sounds amazing by all accounts i guess should we move to the next episode or not episode should we move to the next new story <laughs> yes absolutely <laughs> right okay so this was the other uh, new story i picked out so this one's about another new dinosaur newly named dinosaur anyways um so this one is an ornithischian so a bird hipped dinosaur so ironically these are not the dinosaurs that include birds but the 
big diverse uh, group of mostly plant-eating dinosaurs that includes things like the horned dinosaurs like triceratops and the armored dinosaurs like stegosaurus and ankylosaurus um, and the duck-billed dinosaurs like parasaurolophus and edmontosaurus and so the ornithischians were a very very diverse bunch even though they're no longer with us today and so this is a new species that was uh, formally named uh, last month this one was found in early Cretaceous rocks of China in the very uh, well-known at this point, uh, Yixian Formation, which is one of the formations in northeastern China that is well-known for preserving uh, feathered dinosaur fossils, or you know, dinosaurs preserved with their feathers, as well as many other uh, notable fossil finds as well. And so this uh, new dinosaur was named Changmianya, Liaoningensis. So Liaoning is after the Chinese province where it was found. And Changmian means long sleep in Chinese. And as for the reason why they named it that, well, you can take a look at the two specimens that they found here. So on, on top, uh, A is one of the specimens, and B is kind of a close-up of that same specimen, and C is the second specimen of this dinosaur. And you can see that both specimens are remarkably complete. Like, they're essentially complete skeletons. And more than that, they are yeah, they are, they are incredible. They, they are definitely some of the best uh, new fossil specimens to be described this year in my book. And as you can see, they, they are preserved not just as complete skeletons, but in almost a sort of lifelike posture. Like, they're, they're just kind of like lying down right, up, right there. And it seems like their soft tissues just kind of disappeared around them leaving the skeletons uh, behind in the rock which is really cool so most fossils like the well-known um, well-known feathered dinosaur fossils of the Yishin formation uh, most of those were preserved at the bottoms of lakes and what happens is that you know the animal dies and is swept into the lake or it dies and falls into the lake and uh, eventually gets buried under layers and layers of lake sediment and the lakes are really good for preserving uh, soft tissues because they they are not easily disturbed by water currents and there there isn't a lot of oxygen in those lakes so probably a lot, not a lot of bacteria or scavengers to disturb the carcasses and eventually the the bodies get buried over layers and layers and uh, preserve their all their wonderful soft tissue features but uh, this form of preservation also causes the the carcasses to get flattened so they're Usually when you find those feathered dinosaur fossils, they're on these flattened slabs and the, the, you no longer have most of the bones in kind of three dimensions uh, preserving their original shape. But there is one particular uh, bed, one particular fossil bed in the, this formation uh, where the bones are preserved in three dimensions. And you get fossils like the ones here uh, where the animals are not preserved in, as like pancakes, basically, but instead in this kind of, <laughs> lifelike three-dimensional posture and now the flip side of this is that how, however these are preserved uh the soft tissues usually aren't left there anymore so so these fossils for example don't uh, show us what these ornithischians recovered in uh, whether, whether it was scales or feathers or, or both probably um but nonetheless they they do shed light on other aspects of their anatomy and biology because obviously it's much easier to study the morphology of these three-dimensional uh, skeletons in terms of the anatomy the morphology of the bones uh, and also it possibly uh, gives us some clues as to their behavior and so previously in this particular fossil bed one of the best known uh, examples uh, or the best known findings i guess um, was a small theropod dinosaur a small meat-eating dinosaur called may um, and mm. It's called Mei because Mei means to sleep soundly in Chinese. And that dinosaur was found in a kind of similar posture. Uh, it kind of curled up and with its head tucked next to its body. Uh, and it was interpreted as likely being sleeping. And if you search up Mei, or rather Mei Long, which is the full uh, binomial name, uh, you, you'll find many restorations of this dinosaur in a sleeping posture and people are like no 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 you know it, it wasn't always sleeping all the time when it was alive you should you should try drawing them in other ways as well um 
<laughs> well, what's funny is that a second specimen of May was later found, and it was basically in the same posture. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> people were making jokes about, oh, it was always sleeping after all. <laughs> Didn't you make a, um, uh, art a while back where it yes. was like May doing everything but sleeping? Yeah, yeah I did. Yes. Yeah, I, I think I saw a comment somewhere, that was, which was basically one of similar similar comment to, to what I what I just mentioned. It's just like you know, people should try drawing May doing other things besides sleeping, and uh, they gave some examples. So I, I tried, I drew a cartoon basically of uh, where I tried to work in May doing every kind of behavior other than sleeping at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was great. I'll have to. Uh... Post a link to that one too. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'll try to remember that. <laughs> Glad you liked it. <laughs> but yeah, and it seems to be true of Changminya is that both of these specimens were preserved in what seems to be a resting posture. Now we're we're not entirely sure why in this particular bed the fossils are preserved this way. There have been several suggestions. Uh, so some people suggest that it's kind of a Pompeii-like scenario where volcanic eruptions uh, spewed out a bunch of volcanic ash and just entombed a bunch of these animals at once uh, while you know they were resting and just left them like this. Um, but some some researchers have objected to this explanation and said, well, we we don't really see them like you know. There, there's no sign that these animals are suddenly given a very sudden but painful death like we would expect to see in a Pompeii-like scenario uh, where a lot of the human remains show signs like this you know, kind of mm. flinching or uh, twist, twisting up in, in response to, to that kind of you know, somewhat gruesome um, uh, means of death. Um, whereas these, these um, fossils seem to be preserved in rather peaceful uh, postures, the, suggesting that it wasn't this kind of sudden, painful, uh, hot uh, uh, type of disaster that struck them. Um, the authors of this paper speculate that maybe these dinosaurs were resting inside a burrow and that uh, they were suddenly buried in, in the burrow, uh, like if perhaps a burrow collapsed, for example, uh, on top of them and just killed them in their sleep. Which is possible, but uh, yeah, it's it's definitely quite quite tricky to figure out, uh, especially because they they don't actually know the, the specific kind of geologic context of these fossils. I think they were they were kind of uh, given to a collection by someone else who found them, so yeah, the the actual geologic context is is not clear. Mm. Um, but yeah, uh, there we do know of similar ornithischians to Changminia, although uh, at least according to the phylogenetic analysis in this study, they're not closely related, but we do know of the kind of similar uh, small ornithischians. And I, I should add, Changminia is not very big, so like these specimens are like slightly longer than a meter, I think, in terms of total length, so they're, they're small animals. Uh, and they, they would have been bipedal in life, so they had longer uh, hind limbs, they would have walked around on hind limbs. And this kind of small bipedal ornithischian uh, body plan was a very prevalent one among the ornithischians. Uh, and you, you, you have, you know, all the way to the end of the Cretaceous, you still have small ornithischians that kind of look generally like this, um, which is pretty interesting. So it's a rather successful body plan, even if a uh, oftentimes not considered the most exciting type of a uh, dinosaur. Uh, and so there, we do know of uh, other small ornithischians that we have evidence, direct evidence of digging burrows that where we found their fossils preserved inside burrows and they seem to have some features of their anatomy that suggest that they were capable of burrowing. And the authors of this paper do point out that Changminia seems to have uh, some features that might be suggestive of this as well. Uh, it does seem to have fairly robust features of the forelimb, for example, and, and the head that could maybe help it, like shovel uh, sediment that, that it need to, to dig through. Um, now, they, they probably weren't like very specialized burrowers. That, that they, they probably weren't like, like um, sending all of their time uh, underground or anything like that, but they, they probably they might have dug burrows to kind of rest in and uh, take care of the young, things like that. So uh, think of certain certain types of animals today, like, I don't know, maybe uh, rabbits, like ra rabbits dig burrows to live in, and they can be quite extensive burrows, but they'll spend a lot of their waking hours above ground and feeding there. Um, so it's certainly a possibility for this dinosaur. 
and in their phylogenetic analysis, they recovered Changmenia as an ornithopod dinosaur. Now, this is, a, this is somewhat interesting because there has been quite a lot of uncertainty about exactly what these kind of small bipedal ornithischians um, were. Now, it, traditionally, all of them were considered ornithopods, which is a group that includes the, the duckbill dinosaurs, and basically anything closer to the duckbills led to the horned dinosaurs or to the armored dinosaurs. But in, in recent years, a number of studies have found that some of these small bipeds uh, do not strictly belong to the ornithopods, but are might be equally close to the ornithopods and the horned dinosaurs so outside of the clade that unites those two which is also possible because it, it does seem quite likely that this was sort of a somewhat ancestral ornithischian morphotype that gave rise to all the other different groups. Uh, the analysis in this particular study at least suggests that most of them are ornithopods and that this was one of the deepest diverging examples. Um, we'll see how that holds up. It is a, it is a, a somewhat novel data set that was, uh, the data set itself was published like shortly before this, this paper. Um, so we'll see how it behaves in other um, in other data sets and whether that that result still holds up. But uh, either way, no matter what it is, it's an amazing fossil or a couple of amazing fossils, uh, and it's really one of the coolest uh, fossil finds of this year. I think. What do you think? Oh yeah, uh, I agree too. Um, I'm I'm <laughs> I'm definitely out of the loop as far as ornithischian phylogeny yeah, goes. It right. seems like all these animals that I grew up with that were ornithopods are now not ornithopods <laughs> and it's like what, is, what again and it's, it's a little confusing. yeah it's it's pretty um, confusing and there's just there's a lot we're still not quite sure about but i yes. was curious I'm, I'm looking at the fossil yeah. images here yeah what, what are all those little red arrows pointing yeah at? that's right I, I should have mentioned that yeah so what the arrows are pointing at the red arrows in each image is that uh, it's actually not very clear from these particular photos, but you, you can go to the um, the original paper, which is open access and will be linked in the description. Uh, so uh, both of these specimens are preserved with gizzard stones. Uh, there's a little cluster of stones within the body cavity of the animal. And so that's what those arrows are pointing to is the location of those gizzard stones. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, so the, these um, these dinosaurs were you know ingesting bits of grit and stuff to help help with digestion which we do know uh, happened in some of these ornithischians gotcha okay well at least that's one non-skeletal part that's preserved <laughs> yeah that, that is true or whatever <laughs> right right that is very true um do you have anything else to add to that nope all right so I think it's pretty cool that uh, it's quite likely, so on the next slide I show this, that uh, this dinosaur probably inspired an XKCD comic because uh, just a few weeks after the publication of this dinosaur, this XKCD comic was released. And, you know, you, you can read it yourself. But it's like, oh, cool, they just found a dinosaur that was buried by a volcanic eruption 125 million years ago, uh, which matches up with the age of the Asian formation. It's like, wow, was it okay? Hmm, it doesn't say. <laughs> oh, I love these guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's pretty great. One of my favorite XKCDs. And, and it's hard to pick a favorite. Yeah. There's a lot of them. There's one. Right. I loved it so much I printed it and I had it on my college ball uh -huh. for the longest time. Yeah. It's a uh, little girl's reading a book about dinosaurs. Uh -huh. And uh, the older sister comes over and she's like, oh, What are you reading about? And I was like, I'm reading about dinosaurs. Yeah. And she's like, Oh, wow, I remember dinosaurs. And you know, back in my day, they were all, you know, big scaly beasts, but now they're all kind of weird and they have like dorky feathers. And right, stuff, right. right. And I'm like, mm -hmm. It says here that the raptor uses its feathered wings to restrain itself on its prey while it digs into it with its talons and eats its guts alive <laughs> right right just so enamored that she starts reading about dinosaurs yeah too. right right yeah that, that's one of my favorites too for sure and in fact I, I i was about to mention it because you know uh a paleontological study directly inspiring an xkcd comic so this is not the first example of that uh the one you just mentioned was another example yeah because that, that was directly based on uh, this paper by denver fowler et al in 2011 about uh, the possible predatory behavior of dromaeosaurid dinosaurs uh yeah, in, in fact, it is actually directly cited in the comic, which is pretty cool. Oh, yeah, they, um, 
if they cited that one, I'm surprised. Like, if this was inspired, right? By it, this particular animal, like, the, why did they didn't cite it or not? <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. It, it's possible that they it was inspired by news reports about about uh, Chang Min Yai, not directly by the paper itself. But but still, it, it, it's close enough. Yeah. <laughs> No, that's yeah. awesome. That's yeah. very funny. <laughs> indeed, indeed. <laughs> so yeah, you know, inspiring an XKCD comic is, is not bad for you know, small bipedal Hornetiskian. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I think that's about all I had to say about this. Uh, is there anything oh. else you'd like to say? Uh, nope, I think we've covered about everything we wanted to cover. Great. So let's see. On the next slide, we have our usual acknowledgments. Uh, thanks, Henry and Alicia, for the usual things they do or did. Um, and finally, as usual, if you enjoyed our show and want to keep up with you know new episodes, you can follow us on YouTube and Twitter. Uh, you can ask us questions via our email ad address, which is listed on this slide. And of course, as usual, we'll put links to all the papers and other things we talked about today. So... That's all. Uh, next episode, uh, we'll be going back to Joan's series on human evolution, right? That's right. We're going to talk about the rise of apes and the beginnings of bipedalism. Mm. I'm, I'm very excited to hear that with y'all. Excellent. Excellent. I look forward to it. But other than that, uh, I guess you can say um, take care, everybody, and stay safe. Absolutely. Have a great early October. <laughs>